I'm going to ask the honourable member for the second time from St. Albert, Edmonton to please withhold his comments until he has the floor. The honourable leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, it is a choice for him to implement extremist policies that have taken the lives of 2,500 British Columbians every single year. Since the NDP has asked him to reverse course on his and formerly their radical policy, 22 British Columbians have died of drug overdoses. But he continues to allow those drugs to kill the people in our hospitals and on our public transit. When will we put an end to this wacko policy by this wacko Prime Minister? No. 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 That is not There are a couple of things which are going on here today which is not acceptable. And I ask all members, please, to keep themselves, to control themselves. I'm going to ask two things. One, I'm going to ask the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition to withdraw uh, that term, which is not considered parliamentary. Mr. Speaker, I replace Wacko with extremist. He is an extremist. The Honourable Member to please... I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition once again to just withdraw that comment, please. And I'll invite the Honourable Member... I'm going to ask the Honourable Leader of the Opposition to please withdraw that comment and simply withdraw that comment. I'll replace it with radical no, I'm not, policy. I am not asking to replace. I'm asking the honourable member to just simply withdraw. Mr. Speaker, I replace the word wacko with extremist. Hey gang, what's up? Just Aaron right here, Question Period Canada. How y'all doing? Everybody probably heard about the craziness that happened in the House of Commons on Tuesday. Pierre Polyev was booted by Mr. Speaker Greg Fergus. It was very controversial and there's a lot of debate. These are a bunch of opinions from different MPs, different parties, so you're going to have a variety of thoughts here. Opinions are like, uh, well, everybody has one and they often stink. Let's check out what people are saying about Pierre Polyev getting booted from the House of Commons by Greg Fergus. Let's check it out. What happened in there? I mean, can you explain why all of the Conservatives walked out at one point? Yeah, so uh, after nine years of Justin Trudeau and his NDP Liberal government, we're in a situation where even the NDP government in British Columbia has called for the Liberals to end the wacko decriminalization policy that they've implemented there that sees drugs like uh, heroin, crack, uh, cocaine, um, and all orders of illegal substances um, now being used on playgrounds, transit, coffee shop, patios, and in hospitals. It's a situation where it's um, so wacko that nurses who work in hospitals are afraid of breastfeeding their babies when they go home because they're concerned about the crack smoke that they're being exposed to in British Columbia hospitals. So the leader of the official opposition raised the, uh, the issue of this wacko policy and was, uh, and was um, ejected by the Liberal Speaker um, for calling it exactly what it is. And so uh, so we're not going to stay uh, in proceedings when there's two sets of rules. One set of rules for a prime minister who isn't asked to follow the same rules that the official opposition is. Our job is to ask questions and to hold the government accountable. It's not the job, of course, of of the speaker because he's a liberal to protect a prime minister whose wacko policies are putting people's lives in danger. And now we know that the liberals are considering the same policy. It's a wacko policy, but for uh, for the city of Toronto here in Ontario. But Mr. Polyev was asked to withdraw the comment and he did not twice. Yeah, Why not? Why not? Instead of having this situation where 
he was removed from the house. Why not withdraw that comment? Yeah, quite simply, Mr. Polyev uh, did withdraw the did withdraw the comment. He replaced uh, it. He did not withdraw it. Well, he said he replaced well, it. And, the, the, and, the, and, and, and of course, and, of course, the problem, Mike, is that uh, the the problem is that um, the, there's two sets of rules. There was a set of rules that was being applied to the leader of the official opposition, and there was a set of different set of rules being applied to the prime minister. And so, uh, Mr. Polyev laid out very clearly that it's a wacko policy, and and uh, and so. Um, it's for the Prime Minister to explain why he's letting that stay So what, what happens to the House of Commons? What happens to... It's a very good word. Absolutely. How else would you define what the Liberals are doing? It 100% is. And the fact that the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada was thrown out of there for doing his exact, exact job is shameful. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Ms. Ferrari, any thoughts on the Speaker's decision just now? Just that he's a wacko. What you witnessed in the House of Commons uh, moments ago is a disgrace. It's a disrespect for our institutions, a disrespect for the Speaker. And let's just recap the last week. You have a leader of the opposition who proactively visits and cultivates the support of white nationalist extremist groups, people who have threatened wars on LGBTQ communities, who have threatened to gang rape female journalists. This is not normal. What is also not normal, and which we should not overlook, is that just yesterday, with a wink and a nod, the leader of the opposition threatened to tear up the Charter of Rights. So it is no surprise that now all jacked up on this very extreme rhetoric, the House of Commons turns into something quite unprecedented, where the opposition are asked repeatedly to withdraw their extremist language, refuse to do so, and when they're not permitted to continue with their extremist language, withdraw from the House. No well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I couldn't help but notice a, a refreshing change in the House of Commons this afternoon. Uh, for once, there was uh, it would seem to be a unanimous uh, consent that climate change exists and that we ought to help people in, in need. Um, the, the civil discourse uh, was certainly difficult uh, to, to not appreciate um, towards the end of question period there. But uh, sadly, it was the, as a result of a tantrum and uh, a remarkable unwillingness to call out far-right extremism and to denounce Diagalon and to denounce a uh, an endorsement from Alex Jones in the United States, somebody who has lied for years uh, about um, parents who have had to go through the most horrific thing that any parent would ever have to go through is the death of their children. Um, Pierre Polyev has demonstrated contempt for Parliament. He's demonstrated uh, that he, you know, certainly likes to dish it out. But when anybody brings up something that he's been up to lately, uh, that is, quite frankly, disgraceful, and he should take account uh, accountability for that. Uh, he summoned his entire caucus out of the room, uh, which is. Um, is certainly not emblematic of a government in waiting. So I'm happy to take any questions if you have any on this very remarkable question period today. What do you, what do you think this does to the, the tenor of the House going forward, you know, we're, we're kind of towards the end of the sitting days? Well, we've got six or seven weeks left. There's a lot of work to be done. And I came to this House because I believe there's good ideas on the right and I believe there's good ideas on the left. And I believe that if we work together and form consensus views and, uh, and collaborate on key issues to support Canadians and we'll have a stronger country. But one way that we will not have a stronger country is if we lean in to the ugliest factions of our country. If we lean in on, you know, people who really need a little bit of support uh, you know, maybe we need to reach out to some of those folks who are really struggling with mis and disinformation. Um, but then there's some folks out there who are demonstrating clearly racist, intolerant ideology that needs to be called out by every member in the House of Commons. Uh, and for the Conservatives and for Pierre Polyev just to refuse to denounce far-right extremism on behalf of these uh, organizations that have been referred to by security experts and uh, you know Canadian intelligence as as far-right extremists um, who uh, you know it, it's just going to lead to more violence and, and disinformation and distrust in our institutions uh, so again once again I'll call on Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives to denounce these far-right extremist groups it shouldn't be that hard to do why do you think every party is resulting to uh, name-calling at the moment? 
Uh, well, I'll say that it's unfortunate. Um, I'll also acknowledge that um, I've used words in the House of Commons that later, upon reflection, uh, I shouldn't have. Uh, the temperature in there is is high. It's hot, and people are, you know, resorting to childhood, you know, tactics and name calling, which uh, I think we all ought to just take a beat and recognize we can be a lot better. And Canadians are watching. I saw a lot of young people up in the gallery today, and I reflected on how democracy seems to be functioning from their position. And you know, I was in uh, a grade four, five, and six class last Friday, Martin Street Public School in Milton, and those kids asked great questions. They had good ideas. They what made was, uh, saying that he's being censored by the liberal speaker. Um, you guys are saying he's courting far-right extremists. How do you restore some level of calm to Parliament right now? It, it feels like everyone's getting more polarized. I don't think it's too much to ask a leader of an official party in Canada to denounce far-right extremism and a group who has been identified by Canadian security and intelligence as a terrorism organization. That's not too much to ask. I have a lot of conservative friends. They're not far-right ideologues. They're not racist. They are not extremist. Conservatives deserve to have somebody who they feel represent their views, and whatever those views might be, I can guarantee that the vast majority of Canadian Conservatives do not consider themselves far-right, racist, extremist ideologues, and that's exactly who Diagolon is. That's exactly who Pierre Polyev is unfortunately courting. He went out of his way to visit and sit down with this organization. That is absolutely disgraceful, and it needs to be called out. Actions and why are the Conservatives polling so well right now? I, 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 look, all I know is that Pierre Polyev is spending his free time in between sitting weeks courting far-right ideologues and sp spending time with organizations who Canadian intelligence have referred to as uh, terrorist groups. That is absolutely disgraceful. It needs to be called out cl plain and simple that no political party should be meeting with these organizations and courting their support. I mean, this is something that we haven't seen, I think, in our tenure is extremely rare occurrence to see someone get kicked out of the House of Commons, the leader of the opposition. Uh, I think Canadians see that this is a guy with very, very thin skin, um, and he never apologizes for anything. I, I think in a, a normal person looking at the situation th that he got into in the Maritimes would say, I messed up, I shouldn't have met with these people. Uh, look at Canadians if you're looking to lead them and say, I'm sorry. I mean, these, this is a group of people associated with folks who made deep insults to his family and his wife. If I had done that, I'd be on the couch for three months. Uh, and so he needs to take a look at himself and look at... I'm not accusing Pierre Polyev of being a racist. I'm not accusing him of being an extremist. But he plays footsies with them and he dances with them. So I think Canadians need to see that and see him for who he is because I think it, it's quite dangerous. And it isn't dignified. It isn't something that should be in uh, a person that is supposed to lead, at least in his riding, um, regardless of the party that you're with. And so what the speaker did today was a good thing, uh, and I hope it doesn't happen again. I hope the guy learns how to be a little remorseful for something that's just a dumb thing, and he keeps doing dumb things. So Canadians will see that, and I think they'll need to call it out. Do you think what happened today is going to fuel the narrative that uh, he's being silenced by the Liberals? Who's being silenced? Pierre. That guy's never shut his mouth in his life. I, who silences him? He, he keeps saying dumb things. It would be, I think it would be good if he shut up. He shut his yap once in a while. But the stuff that he does in the House of Commons is disgraceful. But he plays on that. He's a guy that likes to play outside the lines. When someone steps out the lines to, conf to confront him, uh, he freezes. So that's the, guy you're, that's the guy people are in bed with. In Budget 2024, you have a lot of new measures about immigration. Uh, today there was more me yeah. uh, measures announced. Mm -hmm. Are any of those measures going to uh, propose today make it more difficult for people to claim asylum in Canada? Sorry, what's the last part of your question? Are any of the measures uh, today uh, that were shown in that 40-page document yeah. going to make it more difficult for people to claim asylum in Canada? You know, I, th I think some of the measures that they are mostly public safety related, uh, they are efficiencies within the system that I think we can take a look at. Uh, they obviously have to follow due process and what we hold up high as a as an efficient immigration system, um, we want to streamline the process. There are matters that we think are duplicative, uh, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll stand by them. They will need, some, obviously, scrutiny from the House. Um, I think what, what will help with due process principally is the investments of about $750 million to ensure equity 
in the processing times, which have jumped, obviously, because of the flow of asylum seekers coming to Canada and other countries around the world in similar situations as well. Uh, so that, that will help. Nothing overnight, but it's stuff that we need to do because this is a system that does have backlogs. I think the biggest, uh, the biggest impact on due process is actually the, the lag in time that has, um, that has jumped recently because of, the, because of the flow. When you talk about streamlining processes, there's a line that says you're going to streamline uh, deportations uh, for people whose claims have been denied. How are you going to do that when there is such a backlog? Backlog right now, and it does take years for people to yeah. get. Well, the I, I think you know, frankly, there are people that are not entitled to be into this country. In this country, they have received uh, due process upon due process, and it still takes time. Uh, recognizing that is one thing, but acting that on that is, is another. I think this is a step in uh, in the latter direction. Uh, again, this is always in a context of, of fairness and due process. We always look at the system in the way we can improve it. It has challenges. Uh, it has matters that uh, that impact the time between someone gets to the country, gets assessed either positively or negatively, and then is asked to leave or is forced to leave. And those times are, are too long in some places. Certainly they're too long. Are you willing to put any targets or goals in place for uh, the timeline that you'd like those to happen within? No, nope, not yet. Uh, they need to be quicker. Uh, they need to be more efficient. Uh, and I think that's why we rely on uh, feedback from the Immigration Refugee Board, which is not a wing of the Canadian government, it is a judicial institution. And we listen to them when they say, what is it that they need to make claims faster, more efficient, uh, and as well as public safety and the processes they follow in order to remove people uh, when they are not no longer welcome in this country and choose not to leave alone. But just going back to what happened today, I know you said the opposition leader never shuts his mouth. Um, he is tweeting that he's been censored by the Liberal Speaker. Um, it's, a, it's a weird form of censorship to be able to tweet you're being censored. He was not. Uh, he was sanctioned by the leader for not uh, for, for for the unparliamentary conduct that is long standing in Parliament. So um, he's creating his own narrative. Uh, he's been very successful at that. It just is not uh, match reality. Do you think the government has any responsibility in trying to bring down the polarization currently happening in Parliament? Absolutely, but the first way to bring down polarization is not to play footsie with extremists. And when that happens, we need to point it out. Uh, people say, oh, it's just Pierre hanging out with, uh, with, with his base. It's a little more insidious than that. Uh, and these are people that... Uh, Look, these are people that don't respect anyone. They don't respect him. They think he's a dweeb as well. So, you know, I think there's something that, that, that needs to be reckoned with. He has an incessant need to get affirmation and confirmation for any person that supports some of his, uh, some of his views, and he goes and gets them with anyone. There's some, there's some people whose vote I don't want. I really don't, Rafi, and it's, it's not something they can go vote for someone else. But it's based on my principles, and it's based on healthy debate. So, uh, yes, the government has a role in bringing people together. We absolutely do. Uh, but when we see egregious behavior that was properly sanctioned by the House, we also need to call it out. What is that role the government has to bring down the temperature of uh, partisan debate? Well, again, it depends on the issue. Uh, there's no way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brush extremism, uh, whether it's anti-Semitic, anti-Islamophobic, uh, hate speech under the carpet. I'm not going to let it by. Uh, uh, we need to have a place for healthy debate, but I, as you've seen in the House of Commons, it's far more often than not recently been rather unhealthy. And the fact that they were quite thin-skinned and they picked up their marbles and left the House um, is a sign of who they are as a party. You know, you're in the House as yes, leader of the opposition, prime minister, but we're all equal. We are representing our ridings. The rest of the party didn't need to leave today, but you know, th their bread is buttered by Pierre Polyev, uh, and none of them had the courage to stay and ask questions of the government, which is, you know, ver very much a, a privileged time for, for people uh, in Canada. It's something that we're quite proud of as a country. In the U.S., uh, Congress can't bring in people, uh, the executive, uh, Mr. Biden's executive and cabinet, to question them on a daily basis. In Canada, I think it's pretty special based on this Westphalia, uh, based, on, based, based on the parliamentary, parliamentary tradition that we have, that you can drag in the executive and ask them questions every day. Uh, they held their breath, picked up their marbles and walked out of the house. That's a sign of character. You're calling them thin skins, but uh, won't some Canadians look at this and see, and see that, well, he was, he was ejected for using the word wacko? That's not... Uh, an astoundingly offensive word. It's been, uh, look, it, we, there are plenty of unparliamentary and weir, uh, words that are used. They uh, may seem arcane and archaic. I have been guilty of using them myself. When I've done it, I've gotten up and apologized. So 
he wasn't sanctioned for using the word, he was sanctioned for not retracting it. And when he did, he, he was a big baby, and he, for about three or four rounds, he played words in order to not apologize. And I think that is telling of a character of a person. So he used the words, wrong on him, he then was sanctioned, refused to apologize. That attacks the integrity and the authority of the chair, which is sacrosanct in this house. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. So I just wanted to, uh, to comment on um, what happened just in the House. Um, obviously, it's very disappointing. Uh, the House of Commons is, uh, is a place for uh, open uh, dialogue and debate. Uh, and today, uh, we, we saw the real colors of Pierre Polyev uh, when he was confronted uh, with uh, something that happened last week where um, you know, he, he essentially met with uh, extremist, uh, white supremacist. And um, you know he hasn't taken ownership of it. He hasn't accounted for it. He hasn't apologized. Um, I really do think this puts a lot of Canadians um, at unrest because um, for many racialized people, um, what what the encounter represents is is, is something that's deeply troubling that uh, speaks to the othering of of, of Canada. Uh, and I think as a national leader, there's a responsibility uh, for for uh, Pierre Polyev to take ownership. And uh, it's very disappointing. He just walked away. Uh, so did his caucus, and it doesn't uh, really speak well uh, for the democratic traditions that, that we're used to here. You're talking about Pierre Polyev's uh, meetings that you're saying are controversial. Peel uh, police chief had controversial meetings in Sri Lanka with a person who was found to be torturing uh, two weeks earlier. Any thoughts on that? Look, I, I can speak about that at some other time. I think there's, uh, right now, um, what's critical to, to understand is that Pierre Polyev is uh, someone who walked away uh, from controversy when he was challenged, uh, and it is not it's, uh, it's not consistent with the role that he plays. With respect to what happens in Sri Lanka, I, I speak about it extensively. Canada is not Sri Lanka. Canada, Canadian parliamentary system is not the Sri Lankan parliamentary system. So I think there's a definite uh, need to understand the difference and the democratic values that we espouse requires proper thoughtful debate uh, amongst uh, peers who are from different parties. And that's what parliament represents. We had um, three other political parties, that uh, four parties in fact continued uh, question period and, and that is very uh, very important because this is the way that uh, governments are held to account um, and, and the question period is for members uh, to ask those questions and sadly um, I think uh, Pierre Paulier walked away when uh, he was uh, uh, targeted when he was um, when, when we questioned his integrity. With respect Tamil Canadians are asking for an apology from that police chief do you think that there should be an apology for that meeting? I will leave it to um, to the chief to respond to that. The, uh, the conservatives are saying the speaker has been unduly harsh towards them. Do you believe um, the speaker could have in any way been operating along party partisan lines? Um, look, my, my sense is that there was a need for decorum in the House. Um, over the last uh, several months, it's very clear, uh, sitting through a question period virtually every day, that the, um, the, the tone and tenor of question period is, is oftentimes uh, very difficult because um, it speaks to the toxicity that exists within, um, within the Conservative Party and the questions that's posed. There are some real issues that Canadians are facing today. For example, the drug crisis is one of them. Um, and to trivialize and to, uh, to really um, narrow that into simple simplistic arguments is not, uh, not what we need. We need an adult conversation about, uh, about decriminalization and, to, and, and what's happening in British Columbia and in, in communities across Canada. It cannot be resolved with slogans. So what we saw today, um, I believe, is, is a moment where uh, a, a leader of the opposition just walked away from, uh, from, from a very difficult uh, question that he had to answer. He refused to walk away and now uh, you know, he's tweeting out uh, random thoughts that really didn't, doesn't speak to the reality of what happened today in Parliament. That heat and toxicity, as you say, you, you felt while sitting in question period, do you feel that has grown over the last six months, year? You know, I, I go back to um, Arnold Chan, right? So I don't, I don't know if any if you were there when Arnold uh, Chan did his last speech in Parliament. I think it was in July, uh, June of 2017, and he talked about the need for civility and the need for people to get together. You know, Parliament is is comprised of 338 Canadians from all walks of life. Um, I personally like to think that I have really good relationships with people from all parties, um, including the Conservative Party. And I think what's 
missing right now is that when we're in Parliament, we're here to do good for Canadians. We're not here to pull each other down. There is a need to hold governments to account, and that is an absolute responsibility of an opposition party. And I, I really urge the opposition to do that. But I think to trivialize issues of life and death in a way that simplifies it and, and really doesn't speak to you know, what's happening on our streets, uh, I think it's irresponsible. And if, if you look at the, the toxicity around that, that is not the Prime Minister's um, fault. It is something that we're working with the province of British Columbia and others. Um, so to, to blame certain things on, on, on one individual, I think, is completely unfair. Um, and the debate needs to be elevated to a point where we talk about actual solutions. Thank you. I'll ask you a different question. Uh, we've seen uh, military complaints going up, uh, even though they're not doing the criminal sexual assault uh, anymore in that system, but we've seen a number of complaints go up. Do you have any comment on that? One of the things that I think is very important is, is the, the work of the Military uh, Complaints uh, Commission is, as, is, I think, facilitating and making sure that members have a voice. And I think it's, it's really important. Um, quite frankly, I, I would always be concerned about an increase in, in complaints, but we want to encourage people to feel comfortable bringing their concerns forward, and I want them to be assured that their concerns will be, will be taken seriously, that action will be taken, and, 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 and so I think in, in initially we would, would see an increase in those complaints, but we are also making sure that, that every member of the Canadian Armed Forces know that they work in a supportive, safe, and respectful environment, and, and, and part of that is making sure that we respond to any concerns that they may bring forward. How concerned are you that they're going up, though? You said you would be concerned. Uh, what level of concern are you at? Well. Again, I've, I've also taken the opportunity sometimes with the Chief of Defense, sometimes on my own. I've gone uh, to bases across the country. I've had the opportunity to actually sit down in town halls and in discussions with members of the Canadian Armed Forces. We've talked about some of the challenges they face in, in serving their country. I think it's one of the most noble choices that any Canadian can make to, to, to you know, ch choose to serve in our armed forces, to defend our country, and at the same time, we understand that that service can cause you know, some challenges to them in, in their life with respect to housing and access to child care. Um, it, it can be challenging because of the, of the various deployments we, and training that they undertake um, for families. And we've got to make sure, and it's important to sit and listen to them, about the, their experience and to, to ask them how we can help. And, you know, I've heard from, for example, um, some very legitimate concerns about access to housing. And so we're working on a number of initiatives right across the country, military bases, um, in order to ensure that our members have access to affordable housing so that they don't have that concern and burden when, when, when they are deployed or when they move. Um, similarly for their families. And they've talked to, to us about you know, family health care. They've talked about you know, employment for, for their spouses. They've, they've talked to us about access to child care. Those are all things that I'm actually quite grateful that they bring forward. And at the same time, you know, they've got, they're proud of the work that they're doing. They're proud of their service. Um, we're going to do everything we can to support them. Respectfully, I don't think you said whether you were concerned or not. I, I'm not sure you answered the question. Are you concerned? That I'm, they're always, con I'm always concerned when, when any member um, has a, a complaint to bring forward. I think we have a very effective grievance process. I met just yesterday um, with, with uh, people from um, our, 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 our grievance committee. Um, I think it's very important that we have those mechanisms in place. And, and again, I'm proud to be part of an organization. I'm proud to be the minister responsible for an organization that has put those mechanisms in place, has extraordinary, dedicated people who listen to those complaints, work very diligently to resolve those grievances when, when they come up for. We all have a responsibility to support the member, men and the women of the Canadian Armed Forces. I will always share their concerns. And at the same time, I'm committed to making sure that we respond in an appropriate way. What do you make of uh, what transpired during a question period today in the House? Well, I, I, I think it was a little bit of unnecessary theater, but, but quite frankly, um, the language was clearly inappropriate, and I think what the decision that the, the Speaker was forced to make was the appropriate one. Um, I also have concerns, quite frankly, with any parliamentarian. Um, we have had, I think, some very difficult experiences in this country, and I've seen it around the world, with ideologically motivated extremist groups. And, and I think we should all be very careful with any, any action that might appear to legitimize uh, the extremists of, of their ideologies. And, and I think it, it is important that, that, that every member of parliament be di diligent in, in not either intentionally or inadvertently promoting um, those groups because, frankly, they are hateful. They are potentially a, a, a serious risk to many vulnerable people in this country. 
Thank you. Pyromaniac could also be seen as extreme. Don't you think that parliamentarians use inflammatory language all the time, like you just did, calling him a pyromaniac? And, it, and if I did that in the House, uh, the Speaker would call me to order, and I would withdraw. So, it's okay so okay that's. But it's okay to do it outside the House. There are rules in Parliament that must must be followed, and he has not followed them, and he did not uh, respect the authority of the Speaker. The Speaker is elected by all members of Parliament. It, it's the foundation of our, of our parliamentary system, of our democracy. We elect a speaker. It's the first act of a new parliament. And so electing the speaker is uh, the person that we then put in charge of assuring that all of our procedures, all of our standing orders are, are strictly upheld. Otherwise, it's uh, chaos in the House of Commons. And so uh, what the speaker did is very normal. Uh, the speaker asked a withdrawal. We see this happen regularly in Parliament. This is a, a, a rare time when a, a member of Parliament has simply refused uh, to heed the direction of the Speaker. Mr. Singh has also been kicked out. How up. much is, of this is about social media, ammunition for social media and, and fundraising on the part of the Conservatives? I, I think a, a lot of this is about Conservatives trying to, uh, trying to fundraise off hot button issues. This is. This is Parliament, though. This is our democracy. Uh, the federal government has a profound influence, good or bad, in the lives of people. And uh, the reason why uh, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP have been approaching this as adults in the room, fighting for pharma care, fighting for dental care, fighting for affordable housing, fighting uh, for anti-scab legislation, is because we believe the role of Parliament is to build people up. Uh, Mr. Polyev seems to believe the role of uh, the Conservative Party is to tear people down and tear our institutions down, and I profoundly regret his Mr. approach. Mr. Singh was ejected from the House of Commons in 2020 when he was fighting over calling another member racist. Uh, do, do you think this circumstance is different from what happened to Mr. Singh in 2020? When, when that happened with Mr. Singh, uh, we continued our work in the, in the House, uh, and we continued to do, uh, do our work on behalf of Canadians. In this case, you saw the entire Conservative caucus simply walked out. They had questions that they could have asked. They chose not to. I, I think it shows a, a level of disrespect for Parliament that I have not seen in my 20 years on the Hill. What the Conservative MPs were question. accusing the Speaker of was treating them unfairly, uh, shutting them down too harshly. Do you see any merit in that? Or is it possible that Mr. Fergus was being one-sided there? Uh, I think Mr. Fergus is uh, doing the same thing to any members of Parliament. I was asked uh, just a few days ago to withdraw my remarks. I did not confront the speaker. I did not challenge the speaker. Uh, I understand that the speaker's role is to uphold the standing orders and our procedures on behalf of all Canadians. We need to have a parliament where people treat each other with respect. I don't, uh, uh, I don't deny that occasionally we, um, we go off and we say things that we should not say in the House of Commons. We have a responsibility to uh, follow the directives of the person who it upholds our standing orders and our procedures. And this is what I find uh, disquieting about today is uh, when Mr. Polyev, Mr. Polyev uh, chose to confront the speaker rather than doing the right thing, the honorable thing, and withdrawing. Why did it become so heated now? This week, today, it does seem that this is particularly heated relative to what it's been in the last well, few years, really. Why do you think it is right now? I'm not going to speculate. I, I know how we approach our work, and how we approach our work is to build people up. Well, how we approach our work is to get legislation through, uh, building on pharmacare, uh, building on dental care, building on ho affordable housing and, and anti-scab legislation, building on things that will help Canadians. I don't know what motivates Conservatives aside from fundraising, uh, and I haven't seen any sign in this House that they are actually trying to do anything, accomplish anything on behalf of Canadians. Merci beaucoup. So what's going to happen on Wednesday in the House of Commons? We're going to have to wait and see. It's coming up in a couple of hours. We're going to try to get this video out first, and that's it. My name's Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. We cover the Question Period broadcast live. Come join one of our chats. It's a really great community, fun and clean. And we make all these other videos, so check one of these out that's floating around here. If you want to see the whole video of Polyev getting booted by Fergus, it's right here. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Check out that video and like, subscribe, share, get notified. All that fun stuff. We'll catch you next video. Thanks.